All right. Um, should we call the facilities meeting committee meeting to order at 6.01 p.m.? So thank you all for coming. Um, so it looks like we are all here. Pilar is online. Um, has everyone had a chance to look at the meeting minutes? Would anyone like to make a motion? Very thorough. I make a motion to accept the minutes. All right. So I think that would be a second because Barb. <laughs> Barb made a motion. Man, yeah, Larry just speaking out. <laughs> Any um, discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. All right. So that <laughs> so that passes. I think Pilar was saying aye for approving. Um, all right. So the yes. minutes are approved. Thank you. <laughs> All right, did we get any public comment? No public comment that I'm aware of. Okay, let's have Chris. All right, so um, item 5A is Chris Corpola. Talk about the history of the solid waste and recycling. All right, let me find a PowerPoint for you. So I didn't specifically put this together for you. Um, I put it together because I was asked to speak at an event up in Prairie Farm um, for the green, green skills. <laughs> I always want to call it green living. So green skills. Um, There's more to it than I can. Yeah. So they do an event once or twice a year where they do all kinds of things regarding just kind of everything. Community education topics. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's it's kind of like the Foxfire books where it, they tell you how to do all kinds of, you know, like how to render lard, um, and right. uh, you know how to Little how to build curry. how to build a log house. Yes. You know? Yes. Exactly. So anyway, so I put this together for them, and then I thought, you know, you we just had talked last month about um, potential sale of the of solid waste and recycling, and I'm like. You know, enough time has gone by and there's been enough change that perhaps you'd like to hear a little bit of the history because I went back and found all of the um, meeting minutes and um, just other pieces of documentation that existed that kind of put this together. So. So. The Dunn County um, Solid Waste and Recycling had four full time county staff and 34 leased staff or contract staff through L.A. Phillips that manned the, a lot of the outpost sites. Um, it was created in 1992, and there was the transfer station and eight county collection sites. And then these are just some of the numbers, which I think are like kind of amazing. This was 2019 data, but there were 22, almost 23 tons of solid waste and 390 tons of demolition waste um 28,000 gallons of leachate that they collect underneath it from all of the I just call it the corn squeezings but the squeezings um and cardboard and um agricultural plastic 25 tons of agricultural plastic film um and then clean sweep um things used oil 17 tons of deer carcasses <laughs> So uh, among other oh. things. So anyway, it was, it's an amazing amount of stuff. And this is only part of the list of all the things that were collected there. Um, and there were 26 of the 30 municipalities in Dunn County that participated in our solid waste and recycling program. 
So this is kind of a timeline then that I'm going to walk through. I won't read everything, but just kind of like, so what happened? Um, and again, much of this is pulled from the meeting minutes um, from that time period. So in 2019 was the first meeting in which there was a discussion about completing some pre-engineering and feasibility for the building of a new transfer station. And um, later on that year, they increased the per capita fee. So there was a fee charged to all of the participating municipalities per person per capita in the municipality, um, part of a solid waste fee, part of a recycling fee, part of it a recycling fee. And then the city of Menominee paid a reduced recycling fee because they had over 6,000 tons of recycling stuff. Um, and so that was kind of, so there, there was a, um, Moved to increase that in 2019 to $23, up a dollar to $2 on each of those areas. In immediately in September, um, the townships began to question the increase. The city of Menominee opposed the fee increase for them. Um, and the tipping fee for 2020 was so the tipping fee is the fee that was charged to the private haulers to bring their things to the transfer station. Um, and there was a discussion about collect, uh, changing the collection site hours to reduce some cost. And then um, in 20, October of 2019, there was some discussion about the future of solid waste. There were um, complaints received from a township regarding decrease in their collection site hours. Um, and the, there was also a budget adjustment approved to cover $290,000 of essentially in the red for that year. And then in November, there were alternative scenarios. That was an option, discussion of an option for a levy referendum um, on in November of 2020. And there was additional discussion about reducing hours or closing some of the smaller sites. Um, there were questions in December. There were questions from the township about the fees. There were questions about reduced hours, questions about staffing. Um, and there was a proposed per capita fee increase of $2.39, which was not granted. So then in January, that following January, there was a first meeting of a group of their solid waste and recycling leadership, the member municipalities, and the private haulers. And there were um, in February, then there were questions about from the municipalities about the finances and the proposed feasibility study for building and new and the prospect of borrowing. Um, there was money then allocated from the contingency fund for that said um, feasibility study. And in May of 2020, there was another budget adjustment for $330,000 of anticipated overages in 2020. And the request for a levy uh, referendum uh, to spend a million dollars for capital improvements was then granted to put that on the November of 2020 ballot. Um, in 20, July of 2020, the per capita fee assessment was budgeted at $60.05. So if you remember, it was like 23-ish dollars. And now it's $60 um, dollars reflecting the true cost of the operating of the eight collection stations and the transfer station. And when I first saw that number, I was like, that doesn't even make sense to me. And I think I kind of understand. But when you think about it, all of the costs and all of the revenues were pretty stable. And the only thing that really could change was the amount being charged to the municipalities. There really wasn't another place to change something and to increase. So it fell on that per capita fee to kind of balance out the losses. Um, then in August, the city of Menominee decided to leave the recycling program, took their $6. Um, per ton and or whatever much they took and per, per capita and went. 
Um, and then in September, there was a decision to cease operations on January 1st of the following year due to insufficient um, interest in the, from the municipal municipalities. 26 of the municipality, all 26 made a decision to opt out and establish their own recycling responsible unit um, designation with the state of Wisconsin. This uh, solid waste and recycling came back then and offered to uh, um, provide a reduced per capita uh, rate of 2921 to collect those things that the private um, entities weren't willing to do, like tires, electronics, batteries, pressurized tanks, furnitures, et cetera, like that. And 24 of the 26 municipalities declined to have that service. And then there was the, so then the referendum, the, the move to have the referendum on the ballot happened before, and so it went on to the ballot before the decision was made to close recycling and, or solid waste and recycling. So it went on the ballot anyway, and then it was, um, it was too late for it to be um, removed and it failed somewhat dramatically. Um, and then between October and February of 2021 then, um, there were activities were undertaken to sell the equipment and cease operations. And then there was a decision made in 20, June of 2021 to use the facility for cold storage, which did not ever really manifest. So here's just a little bit of more background. Originally, the uh, facility was built in 1991 and it had an intended lifespan of 15 years. And then the county managed to get 30 years out of it. Um, and it before its closure in 2021. A commercial building appraisal was completed for the facility and the adjacent 10 acres of property, which was purchased with the intent of perhaps building a new recycling, solid waste and recycling facility on that 10 acres. Um, it's to the east of the uh, facility. Um, so a commercial building appraisal was done in February 2021 and the market value was approximately $300,000. I don't know what that would be today given the it's going to change in market but that was um, what it was at that point in time so the solid the, stru the structure which was now 30 years old anticipated to last about 15 years um was in is in was in significant de decline and in need of repair and it was determined in march of 2021 they had it uh, assessed to see what needed to happen. There was $213,000 worth of repairs needed to bring it up to code. Um, so if you remember, it's worth about $300,000. It needs $213,000 at that point in time to fix it. So um, the result was that the age of the facility did it doesn't lend itself, didn't lend itself then and probably does not lend itself now well to return a, a, to a service as a solid waste and recycling operation. Stormwater management was another concern. The grounds were not designed properly to comply with state stormwater permitting regulations and due to an oversight when the facility was constructed. And again, I can't answer questions because I'm just going off of documentation, but um, so the transfer station's available acreage was undersized for super for suitable engineering, including putting in a retaining pond um, and proper ditching. And so that would have been that would there was the reason for moving it to the adjacent property. And then here's just the sort of the, the decline. So in 2026. It had a, or 2016, I'm sorry, it had a fund balance that down here in this corner of $1.1 million. You can see in 2016, it lost about $65,000. And then in 2017, it lost about 300, a little over $300,000. In 2018, about $400,000. In 2019, about 123,000. In 2020, it, um, it shows a profit, but that was in part because of some of the money that the county infused to it, infused it, and they were starting to sell equipment by that point in time. 
and then you can see 2022 is just sort of the rounding out of the year. So the fund balance had dropped from a million dollars in 20 1.1 million dollars in 2016 to about $430,000 in 2022. And we're still sitting on that $430,000. It's still there. It's not hasn't been used for any other purpose. So by the end of 2020, all of the partner municipalities had established themselves as their own recycling responsible units. Um, it's just is the title. Um, either by themselves or in partnership with someone else, with the exception of the Ridgeland site, which was closed and um, the land reverted to the original land owner through a quick claim pro process. And that is the history of solid waste and recycling. So I have no mm -hmm. ulterior motive just for you to have that information because it was pulled together and you've been discussing that particular facility and have oversight over that facility. And I thought it would be helpful to understand kind of where, it, where it's at or where it ended. Any questions about that? Um, I would just wonder, thank you so much. Um, and is it possible to get a copy of the slideshow? Because that's fantastic. Sure. That'd be great. Thank you so much for putting that together. So is the transfer station itself like 10 acres and then there's 10 adjacent or is there 20 adjacent? Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. There's 20 adjacent. There's 10 that the transfer station sits on. And there's 20 acres next door. You're right. I'm sorry, you misspoke. Okay. Um, and there are two buildings. There's a larger building, which was where the, um, so, you know, the concept of transfer station, bring the stuff in, the haulers, private haulers br brought it in, paid a tipping fee, dumped it. It was sorted, put however it was put, and then um, it was then moved from there the last few years it was advanced disposal um who came in then and got that and then took it off to wherever it went off to and then there's another building that housed i think did they say there did you say it's got the electronics electronics show yeah. like yeah. and electronic items it's TVs. about a what did we figure out it was about a thousand square feet somewhere around a thousand square feet yeah building that's actually in pretty decent shape. It sits on a slab, um, and it's just a, a metal building on a on a slab, but it's in seemingly reasonably good condition. Um, my only question and a concern was uh, when you when they did do uh, sorting of materials. Uh, you know, it dumped in, people went in and picked out this and picked out that stuff, right? And then it went off to wherever the different materials went. It'd be interesting to know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what what was the dollar value that was achieved by sorting that material and how that had uh, uh, changed. And uh, I remember, you know, working with Walmart at the time and of course, you know, they do lots of cardboard and uh, there was, you know, big issue through the whole industry that, you know, China quit buying cardboard. So it, it's sort of like, um, was, was there ever a net gain in the recycles that were sorted out? versus just dumped into a hole and buried. Well, so um, at the um, presentation that I was at in uh, Prairie Farm, the director or I guess director manager of the solid waste and recycling in Barron County spoke. His name is Brett Bond and he, Brent Bond, and he, he's, so he spoke a little bit to that. So I'm just repeating what I understood that he said that he said. Um, so it kind of depends. So there was there was a lot of conversation in the decline of our own um, 
our own facility between single stream and multi-stream recycling. So multi-stream recycling was where you picked it all apart. You know, you put the number two plastic over here and you put the tin cans there and you put the aluminum there and et cetera. And then single stream where it all dumped into one. And in Barron County, they do single stream in the city and mixed use or multi-stream in the collection sites out in the county. But when it comes into the transfer station, they sort it, they have people that sort it all. And he showed us the conveyor belt that it goes by on and you pick it out and they pull the labels off and the lid, or the covers off of pop bottles and things like that. Um, but he said that when the market changed, there became a lot of conversation around well, sort of what really happens to those recycling recyclables. No doubt that they went to China when they were able to go to China. But once that stopped, he said, honestly, I don't know what happens to them. He didn't imply that something bad happened to them. He just said, I don't know what happens to them when they leave our facility transferred out of here. It's sort of beyond my purview. And then they, in Barron County, they operate an incinerator. So they you all of their solid waste is burned. Thank Cork County, I think or I'm th or I'm thinking that uh um not Baldwin but New Richmond. Mm -hmm. They had they had a big county facility where they energy you know something, you know, they, they burnt it. Now just another interesting thing, uh to me anyway, is that uh, before my driving with Walmart, uh, it was very common at least once a week to have a load of s scrap of some sort that went into uh, uh, um, in Eau Claire, uh, whatever the paper mill was caused. They they, they would they the, they made diapers or, or diaper products, and uh, you'd haul semi loads of scrap failed scrap into there. And uh, I remember it was always interesting. One time I had a load uh, from someplace in North Dakota and it was a whole semi load of uh, baseball cards. And it was every baseball card you could imagine from colleges to thing. And what they didn't sell went uh, to cascade paper, I guess it was at a time. And uh, uh, so, I mean, you know, there, there there are markets for local markets for scrap. There was another one too. Oh, um, certain teed shingles mm -hmm. uh, in at Savage, Minnesota. Uh, their shingles are made, or you know, are the base is recycled paper products, and. Yeah. Uh, it was always a kick that uh, after you took your load of scrap into uh, paper mill in Eau Claire or certain teed at Savage and you sweep out your trailer to go on to your next job, uh, everything was in the bottom of that trailer from somebody's house keys to a T-bone snake <laughs> bone. And and that, there, so a couple of things as you say that. Um, one of the things that... Um, that the gentleman from Barron said was one of the things that you struggle with when you run a recycling program is he said, people have this misconception that, you, you know, you, you didn't rinse out your soup can or you didn't take your lid off your pop bottle or whatever, that that's contaminated the load. He said, that's not what contaminates a load. He said, what contaminates a load is you have a whole bin of um, number two plastic you know, milk bottles or whatever, and somebody heaves a, a jug of motor oil in there and basically, yeah. you know, covers them all. And he said that will, he said, there are, you know, if, he said you, you try to catch those things before they go. But he said, if there's a contaminant like that in a load, then they'll reject the whole load. And then you essentially are you know, kind of done with that. So that was one thing. And then the other thing was there definitely, the other thing that he said and corresponds with things that I've read is there definitely are ways to use recyclable materials. We just haven't found a really efficient way of using enough of them to make it 
like profitable, I guess, for the entities that do it. I can tell you about another one uh, down in Milwaukee at Franklin um, on the northeast side, or I think it was Franklin. It, it's by County Line Road, and it was part of um, their, um, um, they bury it there, and then they also, they bury stuff there, you, in a mountain, it's a mountain of stuff. And uh, also it's part of their uh, septic system or, you know, waste management. And uh, there's a thousand semi loads of uh, um, uh, Scott's garden soil sitting there. I mean, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of those loads go out a week. Yeah. And, you know, because every spot in the world from from Walmart and Walmart to, to uh, 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 hardware store at Elmart. You know they've got those pallets sitting out there, mm -hmm. and they all come from a from a, a recycling center. You know, so I mean there are ways to, to do it. It's just there are not enough ways apparently. But to make it uh, very cost effective, um, he did. Brent did say that the um, at the point in time that Barron County, so Barron County's had their incinerator for about I don't know, I remember thirty years. It's a long time. Um, and he said that the technology now, you know, like it's very efficient and it, it's very, it's clean, but he said to build one now that would meet all of the specs would be about a hundred million dollars. You know, isn't it something though that with, um, everybody facing the, uh, same situation that, uh, and, uh, you know, I don't need to, to knock on them, but, you know, you know, why doesn't West Central Regional, whatever they do, uh, tell us a little bit more than we need more housing that, uh, you know, what can we do as a group of counties to solve this problem? I mean, I would think that that would, I think what we're looking at is a regional issue that we all face. And what we know now, what we didn't know before is what it costs for the private industry to do it. Right, but what we didn't know then, well, what we didn't tend to then was what it was costing us to do it as well. Yeah, okay. You know, so part of the reason why you see those deficits in those years was because efforts to raise the in, the fees for that were met with resistance. Right. And so they weren't raised. And as a result, the county supplemented or they took from their general fund, but three and four hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. So um, so I think that that was when when you look at that per capita suggested or recommended per capita for 2020 at sixty dollars and five cents, that was what it was going to cost to really do it. But no one wanted to pay it at that point in time. I mean, if I if if I would be so bold as to sort of speak as to where the error was, it was that we kind of came into that argument too, too late to say, hey, this is what it's this is what it's really costing and we have to figure out a solution. We were already well into the deficits before we started to have those conversations. Had a facility that last 15 years and after 20 years we decided maybe we better do something. Mm -hmm. And if you ask the chair of this committee previously, he would tell you we run it as a service and not a business. Mm -hmm. And it, it was a service and uh, things were out. Yep, exactly. So, Pilar, it looks like your hand's up. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> thank you. Um, yes, Madam Chairperson, thank you. I A couple of thoughts that occurred to me. One is that I think there's a very similar thing happening now with the fire costs in rural communities, the true cost of providing fire suppression and and emergency management services haven't been raised in many years. And all of the rural towns, including my town, town of Lucas, got a visit from 
the fire department, along with some very distressing news to the tune of like these just like hundreds of thousands of dollars in costs that are going to have to get made up, um, a much greater cost than the difference that you were talking about with the per capita fees on, on the trash and waste management. And I, I think there is a kind of converging pressure on towns where people just don't feel like the money is in their budget. They can't change the levy limits. Um, and I think we're we're rapidly running into a series of interconnecting financial crises. But I think the other challenge that I see, particularly with the waste management stuff, I don't know that there was much calculation of the true cost of not having that service. I think people didn't love the ideas in their minds of seeing a cost triple per capita. But at 60 some dollars a year, that's actually a very low per capita cost relative to what anyone would pay like in the Twin Cities to have their trash handle. And even now, many, many local residents are having to pay more than that. Um, but I think that there is something to be said for how these things get messaged and how the trade-offs are presented, because there is a really significant cost to poorly managed or not managed trash that I don't know has ever been properly assessed, at least at the town, the municipalities level that there's trash building up in people's yards and being dumped in our ravines and people are stockpiling all kinds of hazardous trash that when it does come out of hiding it's going to be a lot all at once um and i think to this you know cradle to grave approach of taking resources and landfilling them because it's in the short term seems less expensive than recycling them it's also short-sighted management of resources and there's a true cost on the other side of that nobody wants to build more landfills nobody wants them in their backyard the the leachate quantity alone <laughs> thank you so much for sharing that 25 bazillion tons of um of leachate that stuff is a cost too so i think it's i i am not an expert in waste management at all um but at the time that the arguments were being explained to me when I was one, I think of the somewhat outraged uh, residents saying like, why are we getting rid of the surface that seemed to work really well? Um, it, it, I don't have a, a great answer, but I really do think that there's going to be a kind of come to waking moment that towns are facing about the true costs of dealing with a lot of things, roads for sure, but trash and fire suppression and all of those things are much more expensive than our towns can really handle. I understand why they push back and I sit on our town board. We just don't have that money, but it has to get handled somehow. So I'm intrigued by seeing whether there's, you know, I don't know how this would happen in terms of a town by town um, kind of roadshow discussion with someone who is more of an expert who can answer some of these questions, maybe someone who previously served on one of the boards or committees that did handle this. But I think that there's a lot of appetite at the town level to reconsider what next level decisions. And if that is, you know, a county uh, facility of some kind or a regional solution, I don't know. But I, I do believe that it probably deserves elevated attention in the coming, you know, two to five years. Um, or I think we're going to be sitting on kind of a, I mean, literal pile of trash that um, it's going to cost quite a lot to clean up in, in the aftermath of that stuff, you know, leaking where it shouldn't or being burned inappropriately at low temperatures and barrels, which I also see happening, styrofoam and plastic and big black clouds floating through the air. There's a real cost to people's health when that happens as well, cancer and other nasty things. So just wanted to go on record as, you know, I think the arguments around true cost, not just the monetary cost of these decisions do need to get considered. And I don't think that that was probably well articulated at the time. Um, so thank you. I, I think it's great that we're talking about it here. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks. So is, is this a, a time to discuss the letter or memo yes. sent out? Yes, I, I have a staff report that I included in the packet. Um, I did some checking into uh, with the uh, DNR about the transfer station. It was one of the questions about um, a cost of sampling for any contamination. Um, the DNR was was very helpful. Um, normal situation, um, the, uh, a phase one inspection would be done on the site. And basically that is looking at the history of what the property was used for. Um, they said with this situation, 
prior to it being a transfer station, it was farm field. Uh, and then it was purchased by Dunn County and turned into the transfer station. And that activity has been done there for third was done for 30 years. So the phase one wouldn't need to be done. They'd pass on that and go straight to a phase two. Um, a phase two inspection would be uh, where the company would come out, take a look at any places of possible contamination. Um, for instance, there was a diesel fuel tank out there that had a concrete containment. Um, they would look at the area that that was. It was placed on pavement. Um, they look in the area and see if there was any evidence of any spills there. There was a waste oil tank out there in a concrete containment. They would look around that area and see if there was any spills, um, any signs of it. They'd look at um, any cracks in the pavement, see if they could see any signs of anything there that there may have been a spillage that went down into the, into the cracks. They would take a groundwater sample. They would probably take a sample from the um, holding tank for the, the septic that is out there, the sewer, um, which that also has the floor drains inside the building go into it. So that's where they got their leachate, collected that from. Um, they would also look at the south end of the parking lot where the stormwater rolled off into what is kind of like a wetlands now and then drained off from there. Um, so they would look at all those things there. If sampling was done or when sampling was done, if contamination is found, that is reported to the DNR and Dunn County must clean it up once it's reported. If the samples are done, no contamination is found, then that report is there to be able to be used for any sale or lease. Much like if there is contamination there, that report is there and then you'd have the report of cleaning it up, which would be able to be used for any future lease or sale. Uh, they also did say that um, any future contamination on that property uh, would, if if there was, if it was sold to someone, um, if there was contamination found on that property, it would have to be linked back to the activity that Dunn County did on the property in order to hold uh, Dunn County responsible for cleanup. Um, if it's sold to someone that took on that responsibility and they took everything, that's that's on them. It wouldn't come back to Dunn County. So um, I did reach out to a company to, uh, I actually had a meeting set up this past Monday for a meeting at the transfer station to find out what a phase two inspection would cost. So I could report that back. And with the snow, we had to postpone because obviously they're not going to be able to do a lot of inspection with the amount of snow that we have. So that's um, set up for, we'll, we'll set that up for um, a time here when it's nicer weather, and then I'll get a cost on the phase two, and then I can bring that back to the committee and let you know. Um, that's what I have for an update so far. Anyone have questions? I do. Um if if a cleanup effort was required, would the cost of that come out of that fund balance that you said was still? Uh, that would be one option, sure, depending okay. on what the cost was. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it might be possible that we could cover that. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, yep. Yeah. No, that fund balance is there available for whatever okay. the board decides to do with it. Mm -hmm. So is, is there any, see, I wouldn't think this would be possible, but is there any way to sell it without doing it and just say, okay, it's your problem yeah. or do we have to know? We we don't have to know. There's, it, it can be sold uh, as, mm -hmm. as is. Um, it can be sold and uh, the new, the person buying it can take, take on the liability of that. That's that's totally possible. It it depends on what a buyer is is wanting to do, and you know, looking at that, of course, you know, there may be a risk involved with 
if it can be any future contamination can be linked back to the recycling solid waste and recycling program there then they could come back Thank um yeah sorry another question um i remember covering the I, is the, is that construction waste um facility that was just north or was it well uh south of there yeah sorry yep. um is that still in operation no that is closed in that when site. did that close I'm not quite sure. I believe that was still open when we were yeah. selling the equipment off from the transfer okay. station. I would say 21, maybe. Oh, okay. Somewhere in there, it was closed and it's been it's capped. It's capped and yeah. and it and it's been it was sufficiently capped. I, I, I believe okay. so. Okay. That, I'm sure that was. I just remember a lot of uh, stuff about you know clay. <laughs> Yeah, how they how how they were constructing it. So okay, I'm I'm sure that had to go through a uh, DNR inspection oh, okay. also to to close it up. Okay, so that that wouldn't necessarily affect the sale. Of, that that wouldn't have any effect on any possible negative effect on the land that the county owns. I don't believe it would. Okay. I'm guessing if we leased it, though, we would want to know <laughs> because so that we could have a baseline of. Yes, if like, if we lease it and someone did some contaminating out there, you know, if we leased it, Dunn County is still liable for any contamination just being the landowner. So we'll wait till we hear about the cost and then but I'm I'm guessing something we should think about <laughs> before we we sell it or lease it to know <laughs> but if it's a million dollars to clean it up all right yeah. well, thank you <laughs> thank you <laughs> sure and so then 5b is the lease of the house yes uh, second staff report that I included. Um, Chris was contacted by, by Dan Lytle, did I say it? Uh, uh, Director of Economic Development and Regional Campus Management at uh, CVTC. Um, they are going through some construction on their campus. They're looking for a spot to lease for a few months. Uh, Chris and I toured the house with him and uh, they're interested in leasing the house as office space from a tentative dates May 20th to August 8th of this year. Um, it's specifically for the adult education services, uh, so that can be kept local. Uh, two staff that serve about 15 to 20 people per day in the program. Um, so it's a uh, something we wanted to bring forward to see if that was uh, something facilities committee would be interested in doing and, and okay. You have anything to add, Chris, on it? No, other than I would just say um, that CVTC has been helpful to us in terms of intermittently giving us some of their space, not on a longer term basis, but um, it's a bit of an our scratch, I scratch your back, you scratch mine kind of a thing. Would there be any, so they'll just pay the utilities or what with the leasing? Bond? That's essentially what I would propose is that they, it's, I mean, it's sitting now and we're paying the utilities. It's a small, if it were a longer period of time, I would say it would be worth calculating out and figuring what it's worth to, to rent it. But, um, but given that it's a few month period of time, they it, it seemed that would be my suggestion, but we can do whatever you think is the right thing. Let's work with them as much as we can. At a reasonable price. <laughs> <laughs> so do we have to make a motion or do we just give you 
approval to work with them. I think yeah. I'm I'm comfortable with us moving forward as long as we know that you're not in opposition to it. If or if you want it to come back in terms of a formal action, we could certainly bring that back for the next meeting. But knowing that you endorse it okay. within okay. reason is fine. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Might as well use the building. <laughs> God, who's gonna mow the grass? Them or the us? Uh, we mow the grass anyways. Okay. We mow the, all the grounds here, so. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So staff and recreation reports. Um, fair and fair board. Deb. I'm gonna get this forward. Thank you. Um, our entertainment is all set and the website has been updated to indicate that uh, grandstand again will be two nights of uh, stock car races uh, special races that they're planning and the ntba truck and tractor pool will be back on saturday and um, demo derby on sunday afternoon and uh, free stage is all set out there we are hoping that um, chicken ranch and the bear creek band that both got uh, canceled last year because of weather that uh, they are coming back so with our christmas in july theme it's going to be cool and we won't have to cancel them again so uh rich schrader who's been real popular on wednesday night he'll be back on wednesday and then um saturday it's called uh, the sidekicks will be performing um they play all kinds of different music and you can go out on our website and you can listen to a snippet of their uh, go to their website and you can find out what they sound like. Um, and of course the memories on Sunday, we have to have them on Sunday or <laughs> it's just a, it's a tradition. <laughs> so, um, we have 90. <laughs> no, oh yeah. We, are, they gonna I, do, are they going to do their Christmas show? Hey, I can suggest that to Tim. <laughs> yeah. Good idea. Cause their Christmas show is fabulous at oh, the yeah. Tainer, at Maple Tainer. Um, we have 90% of our judges hired, which is great. Um, we um, have the sheep and goat weigh in on April 20th. So I don't know, Scott, if you can make a note on that on your calendar. I think um, they'll use the um, the building. So I don't think you'll have a lot to help with to get like move gates or anything, but they're supposed to contact you directly. Um, I have a volunteer that came forward and that's helping me with um, recruitment and training of superintendents. So I got that off my plate because I just, um, it's a lot to plan for a fair where Sam and I used to share a lot of stuff and without Sam, it was a lot for me to take care of. So I'm real happy to have her working on that piece of it. Um, I'm going to let you know that we are having a car show, our very first one. It'll be on Sunday, and that will be in connection. That nice day for that, um, with the memories being there, um, an antique car show, pie and ice cream social from 4-H. It kind of all fits right together. Um, and then uh, Scott's working on cleaning out the um, 17th and Main Building, as we call it, the the big highway shop up there and making sure that that's usable because we have quite a few antique tractors that are coming back. So, um, and we're looking at selling the equipment in the milk house because we think we can use that milk house for better use than what it has been just sitting there not being used for probably the last five years. Um, we don't have a lot of milk cows at the fair uh, and we get a waiver from the state that they come in on show day and then they leave right away that same day. Um, the equipment, the compressor and so forth is, working but it's they can't get parts for it anymore and uh we have some people that are interested in buying the bulk tank the maple syrup people that collect sap and stuff so um scott's gonna put that out on uh the surplus auction for us when he gets a chance and so we can get that building cleaned out and we have we have um a couple options that we're looking at to put in that building but i'll part of our educational piece that we've not been real strong on the education piece of our mission statement. So we're hoping that that will help with that. So um, I guess that's about it. So if anybody has any questions? Thank you so yep. much. You're welcome. Yes, and cool weather. Yeah, it's cool <laughs> weather, cool weather. <laughs> 
and no rain. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 6B, so Facilities and Parks Division. All right, I'll start out with the uh, Menominee Rifle and Pistol Club. Sent over uh, their 2023 report it was in the packet. Um, as you can tell, they do a great job there bringing people into Dunn County. Um, major, a lot of their people, probably half of their people are from out of the area, come over um, and they, they raise money. The volunteers there do a lot for the place. They maintain it, improvements, everything they do. Um, they have the range looking really good and they're always looking for something, some way to improve it and draw more people in. So if you have any questions, um, I can try to answer or we can we can always have Duke come in and, and talk to you about uh, the range. He loves to talk about it. Those guys have a passion for it, so it's it's really nice that they they do that. If there are no questions, I will move on. Um, I had my facility technicians and facility workers do a chainsaw safety training on March 12th. We had a, this is the same company that has done the chainsaw training for highway department in the past. Uh, now highway department gets their training through uh, rodeo days that's put on at UW Stout through County Mutual. Um, my guys are not able to attend that. So we, we had the company come in and do the chainsaw training. Um, yes, yeah, on a warm day, nice day, yeah. Um, so yeah, they, they said it was great. They learned a lot. This was the level one. The company offers three levels of training. Uh, so we started out with this one and the, the guys did learn a lot. So eventually we'll schedule a level two. That way the guys, when they're out there, if we have storm damage or dead trees that we take down, the guys can be safe out there working on that. We have documentation of all that. Um, April 23rd, the, the facility technicians and workers are gonna have their hearing test done. Um, that's something that kind of fell by the wayside, especially with the division of the of highway and facilities from public works department. Um, I know when I started in 2015, I had all that stuff done, um, hearing tests and uh, physical and all that stuff and drug tests. And then it kind of fell by the wayside and then really did after we split off from highway. So trying to get some of that safety stuff back in there to have documentation and, and coverage of that and safe for the, for the guys. Um, all of the staff, including the custodians, have, have completed their safety training videos that County Mutual had provided us through Patty Isaacson. Uh, they completed all those, so they've had a lot of training there. Um, there still is more safety training that I'm working on getting in there, like uh, chemical safety training, um, a few other things uh, just to keep the, the safety going. Um, as far as projects, uh, you probably saw the highway department got everything prepped out there for the start of the, the walk bike path. Um, last I talked to Dustin, so they were looking at in April starting that project as far as the excavation and getting it really ready. Um, but they got everything taken out. I did list the two piles of logs that are out there on Wisconsin surplus. Uh, we did great on the pine logs and not as well i guess on the firewood but we did sell the firewood firewood pile of logs sold for 106 dollars and the pine logs sold for 1150. so it was a sawmill local sawmill that bought the pine logs so we got some good money there so that definitely beneficial um, so i'll just be waiting for them to be in contact so that we can uh, get that picked up and out of our front yard. Uh, county, the fleet uh, is running well with no issues. I have a meeting in April with Enterprise to discuss any future needs of the fleet. Uh, we'll run through the numbers on those and see where we're at, make sure everything's looking good there. Um, financial report, like I said before, it's just got January and February on there, really isn't a lot, uh, not enough data there to report. Um, next month, I'll have a better report for you guys. Um, Energy-wise, I'm still working on figuring out the 
the uh, Excel stuff and uh, the portfolio manager and the benchmark and all that stuff. But I, I will uh, get that figured out so we can get a report out there. Um, that is everything that I have. Any questions? Scott, I got one, and I can't remember if I've asked it before, but I know I've had my ear bent about it two or three different times. Okay. So I'm going to ask it again, or maybe for the first time. <laughs> uh, we, uh, our energy comes from Xcel Energy, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, the question that's been asked to me more than once is, does Dunn County receive the cheapest rate available for electricity, or are we somehow paying a, a service charge so that we can um, be in? Uh, are, are we paying a service charge to to expand um, solar and wind energy? I have never seen any additional charge for that on our our billings. Okay, I, I think this came up at least once or twice after, you know, I think Dunn County announced that they intend to be um, by 2050. What's oh, our uh, carbon uh, free by 2050? Right. Uh, and, um, you know, people say, well, you can do what you want at 2050, but I don't want to pay for uh, anything other than as little as possible. You know, let's keep our expenses. Let's let's not make this a political issue. Let's just keep keep it a dollars and cents issue. And uh, um, if you could check it out as far as what they would like, if there would be a, uh, I mean, you know, maybe people will hear me talking about a day and say, well, for crying out loud, Larry, it's a great idea that we would. Uh, pay more. So, you know, maybe that discussion would be coming down the thing. Sure. No. I do know that Excel Energy has um, their own solar fields. Those solar fields uh, supply energy to certain customers, customers that pay extra for that energy to come from those solar fields. Then there's also another program that you can pay extra for what they call RECs. And if you pay for these RECs, then you can claim that you are carbon free. So we we don't we're not in any any either one of those deals. The um, solar energy, you know, is a big topic for the town of Springbrook. And uh candidates running for the uh, uh, board positions that include town of Springbrook, uh, you know, st state their concerns and and uh, and re requests and and uh, I mean I I don't know where people get their what when where people get their information when they say uh, it's how wonderful it's going to be to have uh, solar fields in Springbrook because now our electricity will be produced locally. Energy that's produced in the town of Springbrook goes right on the 340 line to wherever it's needed. So it isn't like you're buying your sweet potatoes or sweet corn and locally produced solar energy. It just is not the case. So that's why, you know, if you come up with some, I mean, you know, I don't care, you know, people personally can do whatever they want, but I think county government should, you know, stay out of the political business and sure. and uh, stay in the produce, stay in the business of providing what we provide uh, as cheap as possible. Well, uh, Speaking about solar power, I think it's kind of a bad thing because I've never seen so many trees get wiped out so they could run a transmission line from that 
you know, where the solar field's at to wherever it goes. I mean, where I'm living at, they they took out trees that are over 100 years old just so they can run a line. But other than that, I guess it's progress. That's part of the deal. That's all I got to say. Any other questions? Otherwise, I would ask, so um, did we ever have someone come and do like a energy audit? I know you had mentioned a few months back that you had talked to someone. Yes, we uh, um, actually, Dan just checked into that today, I believe, and uh, they're working on their report. They did a walkthrough and uh, the company will have us have a report for us in a few weeks and then we'll see what they're offering, see what they come up with. Because that could help with, I suppose, just tightening up the buildings or looking for energy gaps or holes that we could, you know, yeah. become more efficient and then go forward from there. So, and yes. I think getting rid of natural gas is one thought. <laughs> <laughs> it would be helpful. To reduce um, some of the costs. So, uh, so thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Okay, so um, I think corporate council is still working on leases <laughs> for us, um, and there isn't any action to be taken or reports, resolutions, and ordinances. So our next meeting is April twenty fourth at six p.m. here. Any other? Announcements. We'll see who's going to be here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> there may be <laughs> maybe new members. <laughs> I don't know. So, so it was nice working with all of you. <laughs> well, last time uh, I was the only one that was unopposed, and everyone else had someone running against them. And, okay. And I guess one of them lost. Uh, one way or the other, I did want to let you know. Uh, Madam Chairperson, that I will be gone April 20th through the 27th. I got a job teaching in Mexico. Oh, and nice. so I won't be here for that meeting either way. I hope I'm still here and on the committee and able and willing to serve. Uh, it's possible I could potentially zoom in for that meeting, but I won't guarantee that. If I can, I will. But okay. um, I will just ask to be excused in the event that I can't do that due to internet or other problems. Okay, thanks for letting us, letting us know. All right, if there isn't anything else, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.